My name is Danielle and this is my story. I was incredibly happy. Oh, I describe myself as a wanderlust addict, so I love to travel. It's one of my huge passions in life, and I get so much from traveling, seeing different parts of the world, experiencing different cultures. Um, it's a huge thing, it gives me life. I find that it brings me to life, and it ignites that passion and that creativity in my personality. So I'd always wanted to go to South America, I'd always been fascinated with South America and Brazil was top on the list. So I went into a, an independent travel agent um, which is aimed at backpackers and independent travellers and I looked at tours to South America and I ended up booking um, a tour where I visited Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay and Brazil. Um, and I went on that trip for about five weeks in 2015 and it was absolutely amazing. It grew my confidence. I met different people on the tour. I went on my own and a lot of people went with a friend. So to put myself in that situation, it helps you to grow as a person. It helps you to learn things about yourself. So it was an amazing experience and I've got memories that I'll hold with me for the rest of my life. I did live a very fast-paced life. Um, so I was working in another city and I was traveling there four days a week. Fortunately, with my last employer, they allowed me to work from home one day a week, so it was just four days. But I calculated I was traveling about 13, 14 hours a week just to get to and from work. So I was constantly tired. Um, I was constantly rushing around living this fast-paced lifestyle. Um, I was working for an organisation which was quite a high paced organisation in terms of the work that I did. So you could kind of say I did live quite a stressful life. On the 13th of May 2017, my life changed in a way that was beyond what I could ever have imagined. Unbeknown to me, I had a brain aneurysm. It had been there for some time. It was a ticking time bomb waiting to erupt. And on the 13th of May 2017, that time bomb ruptured. The rupture of the brain aneurysm caused me to have a brain hemorrhage and that put me in a life-threatening situation. As a result of that, I was rushed to hospital and had life-saving brain surgery, which saved my life. Fortunately for me, I'm one of the lucky ones and I survived. And that means that I'm here today and able to share my story with you. I'm able to tell you what I've gone through over this past year and to share some of my challenges with anybody else who's going through a very similar situation to me. 
You getting stuck as he feed in the mud You have been caught in the flood <laughs> While the water isn't parted We run, we put you so the harvest is us <laughs> You have been enjoying life Sipping the syrup and a line in the white <laughs> Taking whatever you touch The sword of the wicked is covered in blood I suddenly woke up in hospital Not knowing where I was What had happened to me or even having the ability to recognise my own family. When they woke me up and the first time I spoke, I was speaking in a childlike state, like I'd reverted back to being a child. And I can only imagine how frightening that must have been for my parents to witness. You have been caught in the flood, wrapped in the sea right now. You have been caught in the flood, I have been caught in the flood. What you mean right now? You have been caught in the flood, caught in the sea right now. They went round the room and asked me who each one of my family members was. And at that moment in time, the damage was that bad, I couldn't even recognise the members of my immediate family. So that is my mum, my dad, my sister, and my eldest niece. I didn't know who they were, and that was a frightening experience for them. Later down the line, I recognised who they were, and then I would often ask them, what am I doing here, what has happened to me? And my parents would have to explain to me, you've had a brain aneurysm, you've had um, a brain hemorrhage. And apparently I would say, that's not happened to me, you're talking about somebody else, that's not me, I'm not meant to be here. And then I would break down into tears and I'd break down and cry. Then I would forget the whole conversation and then the cycle would begin again and I'd say, what's happened to me? That must have just been so heartbreaking for my family to witness because they had to witness me relive this moment of grief and pain time and time again. My parents came to see me every single day they were at my bedside every single day when I was sedated and when I was unconscious. And I had close family and friends come to visit me when I was in hospital. And I can honestly say that was my saviour and that's what got me through each day. Because each day in hospital was a struggle and knowing that I had that support network around me to come and see me each day got me through each day. I don't One of the key things I experienced as a result of my aneurysm was the dependence that I had on other people to get me through my recovery. So in the initial stages of being in hospital, I was so dependent on other people. So not only the nurses, but also my family members when they came to see me. Um, so initially, the basic tasks that you do every day and don't think anything of, I had to have people help me do those things, such as taking a shower, such as getting dressed. I was in hospital for about five weeks in total. I think it was roughly four, three and a half, four weeks in critical care and then the remaining time on the neurological ward. And when I was moved up to the neurological ward, um, it was strange. Um, I would say I was taken out of my comfort zone, which sounds weird. Nobody wants to be in critical care, but that became my home and I became used to it. I became used to the environment and the staff and that became my comfort blanket because for me, those were the staff that saved my life and I'll be eternally grateful to them. My mum asked me what things did I want bring in? And when she asked me what I wanted to bring in, I felt so excited because my life was living in pyjamas for like the past five weeks. So I had this list, I was like, bring my jeans. I was very specific, my rose gold sparkly trainers, my Adidas jacket, and I'm a collector of funky Adidas jackets. I think I've got about eight of them. I was very specific. I said I wanted the one with the leopards on it. Because <laughs> for me, this was my going home 
attire. It was kind of my cloak of invincibility. It was kind of, I felt like I was becoming me again and I could express myself again, so I was so excited. So I put them on and it felt strange dressing in clothes for the first time in five weeks. Putting jeans on, putting shoes on, putting a jacket on, I felt so strange. And I remember putting these clothes on and doing my hair and coming back onto the ward. And I remember the other patients who I'd been sharing a ward with for some time looked at me and they were like, who is this person? This looks like a completely different person. And I was like, I'm ready. I'm ready to face the world. I'm ready to go out there. I'm ready to feel the fresh air and the sunlight on my skin. I cannot describe how desperate I was just to feel fresh air and sun on my skin. So over the course of time of me being on that ward, I developed this fear of I was never going home. I was never gonna get out of this place. So even the day I was prepped to go home, I still had this doubt in the back of my mind. Am I actually gonna go home? And I'll never forget seeing my dad pull up in the car and at this point I was so weak and I didn't have any strength but something, I don't know what it was, some force, something overcame me and I suddenly just found the strength to just pull open the car door and I literally threw my body onto the back seat with every ounce of strength I had. I literally shouted at my dad go, 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 get me out of here, drive, go, go, go. And I was literally shouting that because I was so petrified. I was so scared that the nurses and the doctors were gonna come back and tell me that I couldn't go home. It felt like it was my getaway car and it was my getaway and escaping to freedom. That's how I would describe my day leaving the hospital. Now that I was home, people's perceptions was that I had more or less recovered. But for me, it was the beginning of my recovery, physically, mentally, and emotionally. So when I was in hospital, I had so much support from family and friends who came to visit me and also from the amazing staff. Um, but when I came out of hospital, that all changed. I think there's kind of this misconception of Obviously when I was in hospital I was in a critical state and at that moment in time um, they didn't know whether I was going to pull through and whether I was going to survive. So once they could see that I pulled through this ordeal and I was making a positive recovery and I was finally sent home, a lot of people around me were so happy and I was so happy as well. But the misconception was that I'd been sent home so I was fine and unbeknown to myself was the huge journey that I was about to embark on in terms of my recovery and for me that is when the journey began. So you know I could appear all positive and bright and happy but underneath I could be suffering underneath and that's one of the things that I found when I was on my journey of recovery of I started to find that people started to deplete and disappear and I'm not saying those people didn't care for me, I'm not saying that at all, but what I'm saying is, you know, I appeared to be okay and I really needed that support and at times that support wasn't necessarily there because believe, people did believe that I was okay. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that, <laughs> you know, tracking my roots, where I came from and where I'm going. But like I say, man, always said it, it's not about the destination, it's all about the journey. Ain't nothing changed but the weather.
um, when I came out of hospital, I was in this um, bubble of, you know, I'm going to recover and everything's just going to be fine. I quickly learned it wasn't going to be like that. My recovery has been up and down, up and down and all over the place. And I appreciate that yours will be as well. Because when you're thinking about, you know, you want to get back to working full time, you want to get back to doing the things you love. So for me, I love to travel. I was working full time. I had a very, very busy lifestyle. I was very sociable. Um, I was doing so many things and then suddenly I had this illness and suddenly my life changed. I suddenly went from having this busy, vibrant, exciting life, traveling and doing all these things, to suddenly being stuck in the house, day in, day out, being reliant on my parents to take me places and to do things for me. So the simple things in life that I used to do every single day, suddenly I couldn't do them without assistance and that was really hard for me. Um, and I felt like I was stuck in this bubble. And when I would speak to people, people would say, don't rush it, take your time, be patient with yourself. You shouldn't be thinking about going back to work yet. I was so frustrated when people said those things to me and they were right in what they were saying. But I'm such a person who just wants to get on. And I was thinking, I nearly lost my life. I don't have time to waste. Life is precious and time is precious and I just need to get on with it. I want to achieve all these things. The frustration is time moves on and I was in a situation that I couldn't control. So a situation where I had to recover, a situation where I couldn't work, a situation where recovery was the focus of my life and getting over this illness. But while I was stuck in this recovery bubble, everybody else's lives were moving forward in my eyes and continuing. For me, one of the big things that I struggled with was the recovery time. It was taking too long, being stuck in the house and not being able to do the things that I wanted to do. Um, so that was a huge, huge challenge for me and something that I had to learn to deal with and had to learn that that was my reality right about now. And I will get back to where I want to be, but it's gonna take longer, longer than what I expected. And I think for me, I've got a very positive outlook. I've got a positive outset. And um, when I first came out of hospital, one of my friends actually said to me, how do you do it? How do you remain so positive, bearing in mind this huge ordeal um, that you've been through? You almost lost your life. How do you manage to stay so positive? Um, and for me, the answer was, I think it's something that is innate within me. I think it's my personality and I think I'm a naturally positive person. I've always referred to myself as being right-brained and not left-brained. Ironically, my brain aneurysm is actually on the left side of my brain. So that means that it's the right side of my body that's been affected. It's quite bizarre really, but since I've had this brain aneurysm, I feel that it's brought out this flood of creativity which has always been there and it's always been bubbling, but it's been suppressed for some reason. And I feel that this journey that I've been on and this experience has ignited this creativity and it's kind of reinforced what my life purpose is and I feel that part of my purpose is to share my story with you and to help you and to help you through your journey but to do that through a creative avenue. On the 
that hazy early morning when I first learned I'm your darling. Now I'm tumbling through the hallway to your room. I, I am fortunate that I've been able to turn such a negative situation into a positive by creating this blog because my objective of this blog is to be able to uplift people, to inspire people, to help people to believe that you can go through such a difficult time and there is light at the end of the tunnel and you can come out of it in a positive way. But amongst that journey that you're going through, you will go through a lot of ups and downs. You're going through a cycle of grief, a cycle of loss, there will be depression in there, there's ups and downs and the way that I describe it to people is a roller coaster effect. I would say in the last year I've gone through this constant roller coaster of emotions of ups and downs. I'm here to say to you this is normal. That is normal. So when you get on that roller coaster journey and when you're in your very dark times, as hard as it is, you need to embrace those times, you need to embrace those emotions, you need to feel that pain that you're going through because that's the only way you're going to go through your recovery, you're going to heal and you're going to come out the other end. It's okay to feel that way, don't see it as a weakness. A lot of people see it as a weakness, but it's not a weakness, it's actually a strength that you can face those emotions, you can face those tough times, and you will get through them. But unfortunately, we can't set a time frame, and I wanted a time frame, I was so frustrated, and I still get frustrated now, um, in terms of when is my life going to get back to how it used to be? And one of the realizations for me was my life will probably never get back to how it used to be because my life has changed significantly. So what does my new life and my new world look like? And how can I get to that as quickly as possible? The inspiration for my blog was not only for self-healing, but to also share my story, raise awareness and help save lives. Find out more about my story at mybloomingbrain.com.